Hello and welcome to A Lock-In at the Crate and Crowbar. This week we're talking about true crime television, discussing some of the examples we like, and maybe deciding whether it's okay that we enjoy them at all. I'm Marsh Davis, and joining me to dig through the overlooked details and outlandish facts of this dark matter, the formidable sleuths and or prurient rubberneckers of tragedy, Tom Francis <laughs> and Graham Hello. Smith. Hello. Uh, I thought we were talking about mid noughties open world action game true crime. <laughs> I've, I've completely, <laughs> completely misprepared for this. Well, that's, that's, that was my cunning plan to ensnare you in my game of death, Graham. <laughs> But before we get into any kind of like particular TV uh, that we aim to discuss, maybe we should deal with uh, like the question that hovers over the entire true crime genre, genre itself, which is whether it's okay for a, for these tragedies to be kind of repackaged as entertainment at all. And if if that's what you think true crime does and whether there are good and bad versions of that. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I I have come to enjoy true crime a lot, and uh, I have reservations about that. <laughs> I feel conflicted about it <laughs> because you know the like some of them, some of the these true stories are such good stories that uh, they are extremely gripping and extremely intriguing. And there's like a sort of zone there that I think is fine, where it's okay to be fascinated by something. It's okay to be intrigued by um, uh, by a story that involves tragedy, that involves terrible things happening. Um, but there's no denying that it's pretty easy to slip over into fully enjoying it, like having a good time hearing about the story, which is <laughs> a, always a little bit uneasy um, when it's a real thing. And then I think there's much further out from the safe zone is is the kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, citizen justice, like uh, vigilante, <laughs> fully go Batman <laughs> and stuff, um, <laughs> start uh, taking action in, into the world. And somewhere like, short of that is talking about it on a podcast <laughs> which we're about to do um in which you know sort of uh coming up with your own theory as to what happened and then loudly broadcasting it that to um you know uh, it doesn't really matter with the size of our audience but <laughs> if we were like a hundred times bigger um th there's a lot of questions about uh you know the responsibilities you have not to just throw out wild theories and and uh, mm. have people act as if those are truth um and especially part of the enjoyment for me is um uh, and this is in risky territory is forming an opinion you know you get presented the facts and almost all true crime stories are uh, you know either it's this thing was never solved but more commonly these days especially is they think it was solved but was it um or this person's in jail for this but did they really do it um and those are always inviting you to have that have the opinion that um uh that that a great injustice was done and uh of course these are being presented through a, a heavy filter um that, well, a, a filter of unknown strength that's the thing it's, it's not that you there's a mm. certain amount of filtering that goes on is that you don't know how much filtering is going on it might be a hundred percent even-handed or it could be a completely biased and you wouldn't know because you only have the the end result um and uh the way you form opinions on this is in a much more sort of casual way than you would if you were for example on the jury you know if, if there's uh, all of the thoughts I will say today about my opinions of what happened in, the, in these shows, I wanted to be clear that they should be treated as like, yeah, it seems like this maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Even though I won't phrase it that way because I'll be, oh, he absolutely fucking did it. Come on, that guy fucking did it. <laughs> uh, and to, to the point that like I wouldn't, if I was on a jury for any of these cases, I wouldn't even voice those those feelings. Like some of, some of the, the sort of things that I form opinions based on are totally unfair <laughs> and should not in any way be be part of a, any real discussion about actual justice where there's going to be consequences for the decision making process how about you graham how batman do you feel about <laughs> well this is all just a precursor to starting the creating growbar tiktok channel where we post nothing but uh accusatory <laughs> little videos about other tiktokers that we've seen <laughs> um no, I mean, I, re I resisted true crime <laughs> for a, a long time. I love fictional crime. Uh, I read a lot of mystery novels and detective novels, and I, know, I have done since I was a teenager. But true crime always seemed gross, uh, and I thought myself above it. Uh, I, and, and then it turns out I'm not. Uh, and I've, <laughs> I, I've started watching quite a lot of it over the last five years or so. And, and, and you know, I'm sort of... I mean, the first the first one I watched was Making a Murderer on Netflix, which actually, like, 
just underlined that I was right and that this was a prurient genre and it was horrible because I, I really didn't like that show. And then I didn't watch any more for like a couple of years and then I kind of come back around to it again now. Um, but, and you know, yes, absolutely. There is bad true crime and there is, there is good true, true, true mm. crime. And, uh, Yes, it's very entertaining, and I think all of the shows we're going to talk about today are entertaining true crime, but mostly I would place them on the good end of the spectrum. I don't think they're, that means that they're not entertainment, because they absolutely are, but uh, I guess I'm occupying the moral safe house of, oh, everyone else seems to like this thing, so I guess it's okay for me <laughs> to like it too. <laughs> Always a safe place to be. <laughs> Well, I think there's a distinction between like the true crime, which which is solely there to kind of attempt to titillate or shock. Like, and you know, like my my mind goes back to like the illustrated police news pamphlets from the 19th century, which are all you know extremely gory and um, delighted in in the horror of it. And then there's the other kind of true crime, which you know, I I it, you know obviously it is dwelling on macabre and dramatic events, but really what it looks to do is like unpick the the human fallout of that crime or um as i think is mostly the case with the ones we're going to discuss catalog the justice system's failings um and like it's, it's weird to me that a lot of true crime is pitched as mystery um even the ones we're talking about today like i i think we're going to talk about the staircase and uh if you look up the staircase uh the poster for it says did he do it <laughs> <laughs> that's the that's their pitch for it but like, which is weird i think because it's not really a i mean obviously there are there are questions <laughs> that remain unanswered uh about these dramatic events but like i don't think the good versions of true crime are solely or singly interested in that question um because i mean certainly that gets your attention but i think in many cases these are stories of wrongful conviction or and police malfeasance and i think it's like um aside from our and uh, its entertainment value i think it does actually do a good deed in uh you know it's important for us to see the justice system's workings and its failings and the human impact that had that has um so i think well, that there's, there's like value uh, i think in that yeah yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, in terms of good true crime, one of the best I've seen is the documentary film by Errol Morris, The Thin Blue Line, mm. which is, I'll be honest, not that entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's one of the reasons why it's it, it feels at least more moral than most of these. But it just presents fact by fact a case for the defense of a convicted man. And uh, off the back of that documentary, like, the, it, like th through the journalistic efforts of making that documentary, they did unearth new evidence, which uh, cleared that man's name and he was eventually released from prison. And so it felt like, you know, it was picking up this, this older case and doing actual journalism. I think there's a lot of true crime, which we're not even going to touch on today, which is just... We read, we read the Wikipedia page and now we're going to read the Wikipedia page out loud on a podcast. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of the, you know, I think there are TV documentaries that aren't much further away from that as well, where they're not doing necessarily a lot of original research other than getting some talking heads in after the fact to talk about a case, some supposed experts. Uh, I think the ones that we're going to talk about today are actually journalistic efforts, um, Certainly the staircase, which I think we're going to devote most of our time to, is they're there almost from day one, and they follow th that process and through entirely. And so, as you say, they are documenting, documenting the legal processes behind it. And I, yeah, that's a worthy thing. I agree with that. I think it's also valuable because it's sort of, um, by putting you in contact with uh, events which are deeply traumatic and outside of hopefully outside of one's own experience like they do demonstrate or at least challenge big ideas that you held yourself like your own conceptions of justice you know what what is punishment what, what the value of forgiveness and like uh, throughout all of these um all of the literally all of the uh, documentaries that i've ever watched it strikes me how keenly some people feel the guilt of another person uh, how they never let go go of that, you know, how it is vital for their own sense of closure that someone be punished. Um, not that they ever seem to get closure. 
Like that also seems to be a commonality. Uh, and regardless of the actual facts, and you'd hope that like in a similar circumstance, you might be you know, more more rational or even like in a case of definitive guilt, maybe, you know, the, the best version of yourself would be able to find some measure of forgiveness or at least accept, even if you couldn't forgive that society has to attempt to rehabilitate. But, you know, I don't know that I would. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, clearly the justice system itself is just institutionally averse, to say the least, to ever accepting it has any flaw, um, no matter how grievous and blatant those flaws are. And so I think those are like fascinating moral and social questions to me that are, 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 that are raised by these things. And to some extent, they sort of give a hall pass to these documentaries that would otherwise be seen as just feeding off tragedy. Um, but of course, as you say, there are there are plenty that do just do that and they are bad. <laughs> Speaking of the justice system uh, struggling to admit its faults, there's an amazing moment in the staircase where uh, the DA at the time uh, starts to kind of falteringly make the case to the documentary maker that uh, perhaps uh, the current situation is actually the justice system working. And the current situation is that Michael Peterson has been in jail, was convicted of the murder of Kathleen Peterson, uh, went to jail for eight years for it, and is now released on the um, <laughs> because the evidence is uh, is thrown out. But he's still he's not free. He's under house arrest, and it's pending a new trial, but that could take years. <laughs> it's like under what frame of reference is this <laughs> it working? Yeah. Like if he's innocent, he spent eight years in jail for for a thing he didn't commit if he's guilty he's out <laughs> like, on no level is that functioning <laughs> we should probably uh, go back to where it began sort of uh with <laughs> the first ever true crime. <laughs> <laughs> with cain and abel um uh, with, uh, <laughs> serial season one uh which was uh, sort of the progenitor of of a particular wave of crime fiction that occurred during my life um um but before, actually, before we do get to that, I will say um, that we are going to immediately cross the spoiler threshold for all of the shows we talk about here. Um, I think it's interesting that I don't consider them spoilable. Uh, like, definitely the way that a lot of these are constructed to deliver information um, is is dramatic and exciting for that reason. But it's also, to me, ideally that's not the purpose. So the, ideally, the purpose is to deliver information about a real thing that happened <laughs> in a measured way that helps the, the viewer understand what's happening. And so personally, I don't feel like that the, the things that I find valuable here are not principled on the storytelling, though that might be good or bad. Um, so I don't actually generally mind discovering factual information about these real events outside of the kind of the linearity of any single documentary. But if you feel otherwise, you've been warned, spoilers um, abound. Do you feel the same way about spoilers? Um, actually, like, well, not entirely, but I think the part, well, the thing I, I agree with is like the, um, is like if it's, if you're sort of getting the right thing out of it, then spoilers should matter less to you because like the thing that you can spoil is the real entertainment value. It's the real juicy, like, you know, roller coaster ride of, of actually enjoying these as, as stories. Um, so that can be reduced. Um, but as I said at the start, that's sort of the problematic part of enjoying true crime. So <laughs> it's fair enough. Yeah, I, I'm similar to you, Marsh, in that I don't really care about spoilers. In fact, if I am if I get into watching a true crime show, I will pretty much instantly bring up information about the case on my phone and start reading like way ahead of wherever I'm at in the in the documentary series. And one of the things I like least about these shows is the way that they often structure the information they give you around twists and shock reveals at the end mm. of episodes. Um, yeah. you know, these things are being edited together long after the fact. They don't have to do that. And oftentimes I've watched shows, a Joe Exotic, um, I can't remember what that show was actually called, but that's one Tiger example. Tiger King? Tiger, Tiger King, King, that was yeah. it, yeah. Where I think they do like an entire episode laying out the supposed case for why this woman... Um, murdered her husband and then kind of reveal at the end or at the, maybe even in the next episode oh actually there's no evidence <laughs> really at all <laughs> after having you know and it's kind of done in the sense of like oh this is part of the story and this is one of these theories and da 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 da, da and they lay it out over the course of 50 minutes or so and it's like but you know <laughs> that, that, that none of that actually adds up to anything yeah. and you've got every detective who was involved in this investigation on film saying this happens every time 
uh, someone's partner is killed. There is always suspicion on the on the surviving spouse. Da 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 da. Like explaining why none of that evidence actually means anything or counts for anything. And here's the counter to this, and here's the alibi to that. But they do that only after laying out the case first. And it's like, well, that's bullshit. Like even if you corrected me eventually, you've you've done this for the sake of drama and so i yeah i'll just i'll just google stuff and i'll read online and accepting that what i'm reading online isn't necessarily the whole story either but i'm at least getting more of the information sooner yeah we should revisit that topic when we come to the beverly lynn smith uh case because um mm. there's some especially i always think like what, what if someone stops watching after this episode like <laughs> <laughs> and especially in that one there's some uh really important information you don't have yep. um but yeah let's get on to serial um that was, uh, I don't think we're, we're going to go through this this case in, in great detail, but I think that was, as you say, like a really important moment. And it was kind of the the, the uh, starting pistol for this like current wave of, ooh, that was an accidentally on theme metaphor. Um, uh, <laughs> or maybe it would be more on theme if it was about marathon running, but <laughs> um, it kind of kicked off this current wave. Shall I synopsize it? Yeah, sure. Uh, so it followed the um, the uh, fallout of the murder of Haimin, Haimin Lee, uh, who is an 18-year-old student in Baltimore, uh, and the arrest and ongoing incarceration of her sometime boyfriend, Adnan Syed. Um, I feel like it was novel at the time because of the, the amount of access they had um, and the seeming care and sensitivity of the broadcasters. But particularly striking was the fact that the case was developing as the show was going out with those events then shaping the later episodes, unless I'm completely mistaken. But like, how did you guys feel about this uh, as like the, the beginning of a new wave of uh, true crime and at the time and now with hindsight? Um, yeah, it, like it was incredibly compellingly told and an incredibly compelling case. Like it's just uh, right away, it, uh, the case against Adnan does not seem to add up. And the thing I really liked about it and still do like about it is, uh, even compared to all of what else we're going to talk about, is that although it's sort of uh, sympathetic towards Adnan, like Sarah Koenig, the, um, the main producer, um, is sort of taking, on, taking this on as a, as a show because she thinks that um, there are questions about uh, his guilt and that she's sort of leans towards he's probably innocent. But at the same time, her voice is in it directly, which is not true of most documentaries. And uh, she questions whether that's uh, whether Adnan could be guilty. She, I think there's a whole episode uh, dedicated to the case against him. Um, and as she investigates it, you can hear her kind of hitting upon evidence that doesn't look good for Adnan and just saying, this doesn't look good for Adnan. And um, that kind of honesty uh, I found really um, compelling. And I actually, I really miss it in the other stuff we have. I wish, even if you're trying to convince me someone is innocent, I want to hear about your doubts and I want to hear... Uh, I want to hear your voice because there is always a voice in these documentaries. They almost mm. all of them have an, an opinion, and especially making a murderer. With, you know, the, the opinion of the filmmakers is is there at every turn, uh, but the filmmakers aren't there t t saying it. And I think obviously it's a podcast form, so it's a different uh, genre. But actually having the the documentary maker or the editorial person uh, be a, a voice in it and express opinions and express doubts both made the filter more explicit. You know that. You're, you're being told that this person is you know, looking for evidence that this person is innocent. So, you, you know, just more upfront. I don't think many people are under illusions about that, that there is a filter, but having it, putting it up front feels more honest. And then also just, just having a little bit of, of doubts and when there is evidence against the person mentioning it and trying to weigh it, you hear her actually trying to weigh it, you know, she, uh, the, the series ends and she tries to, um, uh, come to a conclusion and can't and just says you know we still don't know but what we can say is that he didn't get a good defense at trial uh, yeah. we can say there's flaws in the prosecution's case and and so on and so on which feels actually very much in line with how i felt about it too like i come away from a lot of these things thinking well i still don't know if the person did it but we can say that was a terrible fucking case <laughs> like the, <laughs> the defense was was appalling or the judge's decisions were appalling or there's this very often you what the one thing you can say for sure is that the justice was not uh was not adhered to strictly yeah i think what i mean the overriding takeaway from nearly all of these is that jurors simply do not understand the idea of reasonable doubt in any way <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um and yeah. then you know i, I who, who could say if adnan Syed is innocent or guilty really at the end other than himself but 
Uh, it's certainly true that the investigation was shoddy, racist, and you know his side of the trial was poorly presented. And I think that's significant enough of a takeaway to uh, justify the existence of a documentary. Um, yeah, he's forty um, now, by the way. Wow. Uh, uh, he and apparently he. Um, I, I, during um, serial, there was they uh, they did sort of unofficial test of DNA DNA samples from the uh, the body of Hymin Lee, um, and he's now successfully applied for official DNA samples to be conducted. But I don't believe that they have as yet. But that happened in March this year, so I don't. Maybe there will be some development further. But he's otherwise had um, all of his uh, attempts at appeal or similar legal um pleas quashed so far mm. yeah so maybe we'll uh just bounce off that into making a murderer briefly just <laughs> i think I, I kind of said what i want to say about it really which is just that that was that's this netflix documentary which um uh i i am pretty fuzzy on the particulars of this case it's been long enough that i don't remember um the details but it's one where you definitely feel that the the entire point of the documentary is to convince you this guy is innocent um and uh it it just was it was painful to watch at times because there are really frustrating injustices in the in the court stuff like watching the the judge sort of throw out evidence that's absolutely vitally relevant um uh but i left not really having a, a clue as to the guy's guilt or innocence because it was the filter was so strong on that one it was just like i can just tell you're just desperate bending over backwards to try and convince me he's innocent and it, the result of that is i don't know what to think um and yeah that basically is is uh where i landed on that one it just didn't work for me because it, it felt so strongly filtered yeah i mean I, I think that's definitely true of the um the crime as it pertains to the main uh the the, the main accused um stephen avery stephen avery thank you yes like i mean, uh, i don't I, d I don't know whether from this I would ever venture for opinion on whether he was innocent or guilty, but whatever the case there, like his nephew also goes down for the crime and is very much bullied into giving a false confession, which, <laughs> which I think yeah, is like is... A, another hallmark of this mm. genre, which is that like alongside jurors not understanding reasonable doubt, false confessions seem to be something that people do not understand. In fact, I think in at least one of these, uh, f films we've watched for this, uh, several people say people don't confess unless they're guilty <laughs> and they literally do and it's it's deeply distressing to watch in this case because the uh the kid uh brendan dassey who has learning disabilities is just uh you know it's all on film uh, and you can see and you can make your own mind up about how uh how he is brought to admit to a crime um but he's kept in a room and just browbeaten and controlled uh while he's crying and asking for his mother and you know eventually starts trying to say whatever the cops want him to say but he clearly doesn't know what the cops want him to say and so he starts saying stuff which doesn't fit with the crime and then the cops correct him they literally tell him what to mm. say bit by bit until he ends up giving them the details that they want and then they declare that it's cast iron because he had information about the crime that only the murderer would have had. <laughs> but they literally told him it, you know, a weeping mentally impaired child on camera. Um, and he's still in jail. So <laughs> if nothing else, you know, these documentaries tell us in no uncertain terms what a disastrously broken justice system there is. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know the, the rest about making a murderer. I, I have some similar reservations to you guys, but I, I think that part of it was uh, made it all worthwhile. C cops in general don't come off well in any of these, <laughs> <laughs> any of these true crime documentaries that we're going to talk about today. Uh, yeah, that's definitely a running theme. I think uh, the, the the detective in in. Um... The I guess we haven't talked about it yet, but Sophie Murder in West Cork. I feel like that's the only oh, yeah. in my head where the detective was seemed pretty reasonable. Yeah, the Irish Columbo is great. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's a he's he's a great character, um, but there are there were a bunch of things in that case where the police were found to have mishandled evidence and to have improperly released information to the press about the case mm. and. Part of the evidence got destroyed when their you know police offices were flooded, and you know they were 
there's been reviews of how they handled themselves that uh, the police don't come off particularly well in. But yes, that one detective was was great. <laughs> I did love him. <laughs> Shall we talk about the staircase? Yes, and also the staircase. As mm. the staircase is not one thing, but two. Uh, which is to say that it is originally an incredibly long, multi-part Fly on the Wall documentary about a 2001 homicide investigation, the trial and the fallout, and it's filmed across many years, maybe decades, plural. Um, and it's also, very recently, uh, an HBO dramatization, which follows not just the same case, but also the filmmakers of the original documentary. Um, the former is on Netflix US currently, is it? I don't know if it's on Netflix UK. Um, but it's it's really worth your time. And the second is on HBO, as I said, and uh, probably isn't worth your time, I would say, uh, for ethical reasons, despite really good performances uh, from Tony Collette and Colin Firth, amongst others. Um, I'd never actually heard of either until I saw the thumbnails uh, pop up for the two different shows. And then I was really confused by the fact that they had the same name, but seemed, seemed to be different um, productions. Uh, but it turns out like the staircase documentary is is sort of like the daddy of all true crime documentaries, unbeknownst to me. Um, originally released in 2004 and then updated uh, as well as new developments in the trial occurred many, many years later. Um, and as with a lot of these documentaries, uh, it, it is obliged uh, by the nature of time to focus more on the suspect, really, and on and the the trial than it does, or it can, on the victim. Uh, the victim in this case being Kathleen Peterson, who's a, a successful executive at a big telecoms firm, um, who's then found in this tremendously gory state at the bottom of a stairwell in her house. And the suspect is Michael Peterson, her husband, who's a novelist and a newspaper columnist. And he reports this as an accident to the police and is immediately arrested when they turn up and quite understandably, <laughs> in my opinion, assume that this could not have possibly been an accident because the the, uh, the scene is just so horrendous. Um, yeah. So, I mean, across the, I, the, across the course of the many years that follow this, like, there's been loads of theories that are put forward. Um that uh, tried to explain Kathleen Peterson's death. But I, th I think, I, I don't know if you agree, but I feel like none really wholly fit the crime scene. And that is uh, not, or not even the scenario that in which her husband kills her. Um, but like the, the key detail, I think, underestimated by his defense team, I think, is that like any reasonable human's surface impression of that crime scene is that it is a scene of a very bloody murder. And that the fact that, you know, the defense finds forensic experts to say that, that this much gore could have occurred as the result of a fall. It sort of feels really by the by, like no one would look at that scene and immediately assume that uh, it was an accident, which is exactly what Michael Peterson does in his phone call to the police. And that yeah. strikes me as the main reason to suspect him. But whether that suffices uh, as a reason to convict him is a completely different matter. And I think, like, you know, it comes down to the concept of reasonable doubt once again. Yeah, that, that's one. It's an interesting one. I I had heard of it and had uh, I'd even watched the first episode and um, kind of bounced off it until you recommended it, Marsh, uh, more recently. And my sort of initial impression of it was that I wasn't interested in it because I didn't see a compelling reason to think he didn't do it. Like it was just um, seems like he may well have done it. I I'm sure the case against him, you know, may not be ironclad and might not hold up in court and if i was a juror i might find reasonable doubt but in ter terms of true crime i kind of want to see like you know how could this be that kind of thing <laughs> um you know uh, and after watching once i did go back into it um uh, on your recommendation uh, i did kind of end up in that place i mean your recommendation was actually not about the interestingness of the the you know physical mm. possibility of the case or anything it was more about the cast of characters and the the drama around it and the um right yeah. how wild uh, all of that stuff is um which is all true um yeah, and yeah I think, the, I mean, the more you think about it the more as you say like the more you think about it the, the less any theory makes sense like the murder theory <laughs> like i it's sort of i lean towards it it seems like the most likely thing to me still after having watched the whole documentary um but it does it is a very um 
it's full of bizarre questions like it's weird no matter how it happened if it if it was an accident mm. and, and that happened it's extremely weird if it was you know an intruder that's kind of weird because there's no evidence of it and there's no kind of connection uh, if it was an owl <laughs> which is a <laughs> prevailing theory that's i don't need to explain why that's weird <laughs> um, and if it was him it's weird that he would do it in that way <laughs> I've, I've come come around to the owl theory <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't i wouldn't uh, put any money on it but like uh as as something that fits the apparent details of the case it is better than at least the version of the murder which the prosecution present whether there are other versions of the murder would be more compelling than an owl having done it <laughs> i don't know but I, yeah. this is the thing I mean, we're already talking about you know the the whodunit aspect of of the crime but actually i don't think uh, that's really and that's not how i sold it to you i don't think that's the thing that makes this as a documentary valuable um uh you, you know it's it is uh i mean it's everything of that happens around the crime in the trial that's that's interesting to me and um part of that interest is in a desire for like a, a better more sophisticated pursuit of justice than these incredibly bungling cops and their corrupt <laughs> crime scene analysts offer but a lot of it is just in just in the human drama of um, trying to make the defense's case um, and it's just this you know exercise in a, a struggle to kind of argue to prove to convince even in the face of just media idiocy and dodgy prosecutor prosecutorial behavior and then new startling rev revelations that just drop on the defense team from the skies above it seems and just the human effort and intellect and emotion that is brought to bear on on trying to make uh Michael Peterson's case for innocence, I, you can't help but sympathize with that as like just uh, an intellectual and uh, you know emotional endeavor. And it helps that a lot of the characters involved in that are very personable and, and, and uh, appealing people. Like Dave Rudolph, who's the lead lawyer, is just, I, I, mean, I don't know how you feel about it, I found him incredibly likable. Like he's just yeah. this, he's a little bit swaggering, he's smooth talking, he's very funny, he has a lovely beard. Um, <laughs> and he's, you know, he's a comp uh, accompanied by this just hulking investigator guy who's got this <laughs> slick back, receding white hair, he's this absolutely forever gloomy would, countenance. He's the person you would cast as a private investigator in a yeah, show like this. Absolutely. Like, yeah, that's exactly what you put in the casting call. <laughs> slouches around in the leather jacket it's, it's fantastic i mean a lot a lot of the characters just seem to have stepped off you know the pages of a, a unbelievable book <laughs> yeah like michael peterson's Diggy. first wife oh du oh Dwayne diva yeah <laughs> just i mean absolutely a cartoon character like he just looks he, if you looks like a if you wanted to dick. <laughs> <laughs> if your brief for like drawing a cartoon character was like okay he's he's like a uh a blood splatter uh, uh, analyst. So he's, he's like super nerdy, but he's also kind of an idiot <laughs> and he's <laughs> wildly wrong about everything, but also lies about it. <laughs> like, how would you draw him? You'd draw him like this. Gawking, really... bug-eyed idiot. Yeah. <laughs> it's really interesting because like, I don't find the characters in The Staircase as cartoonish as the other documentaries we'll talk about. Like we talked about the Irish Columbo and uh, in, in, in the unsolved murder of Beverly Lynn Smith, like everyone in it is such a sad desperate kind of small town cliche whereas in this they are they're much more relatable and much more likable um but it was much more the legal processes that um that i was interested in it's it's it they get an insane amount of access much more so than any of these other shows where they're coming in the documentary crews are coming in much after the fact the documentary crew in the staircase is there from i think like a week or two after the crime or something like that and then follow the process throughout yeah, when, so like i found is... it really when he's convicted of murder, the camera follows him. Like, he can't talk to his family or anything. Like, when you get convicted, you're just immediately taken to jail. The camera follows him to jail. <laughs> it's insane. <laughs> like, how do they get that access to that? Yeah. Yeah. And this, I mean, the, the, like, there's a moment where Dave Rudolph literally discovers on camera that another woman in Michael Peterson's life fell down the stairs of her home and died. <laughs> and he just just looks... You know, grimly at the camera and says, "Well, I guess your film got better." <laughs> uh, it's just, but it's just full of, uh, you know, d d a life apparently throws up uh, these ironies all the time. It seems in in this case, uh, like one of my favorite scenes in this, and maybe nearly one of my favorite scenes in anything, is when uh, Dave Rudolph is preparing for like a, a really vital bit of oh, yes. the trial. 
Um, and he's trying to run through his presentation uh, yeah. with some guy manning his PowerPoint slides. And he just com- com- repeatedly gets derailed with an escalating level of farce to the point where the building is going to be evacuated for a fire. <laughs> and, he, and he obviously has this meltdown at the end. And I just I never felt somebody get angry at PowerPoint in a, such a relatable way. <laughs> But I, I don't know that the characters aren't strangely caricaturish. I mean, there's there's some very strange people in this. Like, Michael Peterson's first wife is just out of this world strange. She has the most formal and Baroque way of talking mm. that, uh, than, that I've ever seen, uh, I think. <laughs> and and the, you know, some of the cops are even stranger as well. Like, the, the prosecutor, Freda Black, she's got this massive kind of bouffant and has this southern drawl. And she's just barely able to bring herself to say the word homosexual because she's mm. scandalized by the very existence of pornography on, on Peterson's computer. Uh, and like her, her, like one of her clinching attacks on Peterson's character is that he's not only bisexual, but a writer of fiction. <laughs> As though, she, calls him, though, she calls him a fictional writer, which is... Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just a writer, it's a fictional writer. <laughs> The defense should have used that. Should have been like, we can't convict him. He doesn't exist. (laughs) I like getting like access to things I don't think I've ever seen before. Like when the defense is running almost like focus groups in order to get a sense of what the jury might feel about certain pieces of testimony. And so, for example, you see them with, uh, I think it's, I think his name's Henry Lee. He's like a forensic scientist and he's an absolute expert in his field and he's written books and he like runs a school where he teaches like a, a blood splatter analysis and that sort of stuff to other people. Um, but he has a little bit of an accent. He's an Asian man and he, del- he delivers the testimony he's going to give in court to this kind of focus group. And then the defense attorneys listen to the focus group to talk about that testimony where they're all saying, oh, I, I couldn't could understand be bare- what he was saying. <laughs> saying yeah. He reminded me of my high school gym teacher. I couldn't understand him either. <laughs> you know, that sort of stuff. And it's just like, Oh my God. like, um, it's it's amazing. Like that's why the the defense attorney is so likable. I think like he has this avuncular quality mm. where he is unflappable in this in just constant setbacks and constant idiocy yeah. he's presented with. He's so sanguine, and like we get to the point where he has to step away from the case after like a decade. I feel so sorry for him because it, it he he absolutely did his best, <laughs> uh, and he's uh, he's never like it, the interaction between the case and the media is also uh, shown in brief. I think here where like. D- Dave Rudolph absolutely demolishes the uh, Dwayne Diva guy on the stand, um, the gawping bug-eyed um, bud spatter expert, who is late, later turns out to be fully corrupt <laughs> and goes to goes to prison for it. Um, and you know he he just completely obliterates him on the stand. It's it's a joy to watch to see just him him completely satisfyingly pull apart this this fool, and then that. You see later that evening, the defense's joy turned just to absolute disbelief as they watch the news after the trial and see that the pundit they've brought on completely garbles like a synopsis of the day of day's events and then gets absolutely the diametrically wrong conclusion from the testimony. And there's just, ah, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, that's, uh, you don't get that kind of insight, I don't think, into the machinations of a, of a case elsewhere. So after that 10 year break, um, uh, Michael uh, wants a retrial and is asking um, uh, David to do it. And uh, David just basically can't go through it again. You just see he's kind of broken Mm -hmm. by the whole thing. And Michael is not very sympathetic. He's like, oh, so you're abandoning me, are you? I'm like, Jesus Christ, dude, mm. you've got to realize this guy is not on trial for murder. He, This is his job. And he fucking gave it his all for years of his life. And it broke him. And yeah, he does not, especially when you can't pay him, <laughs> does not need to go through it again. Yeah. The defense attorney, he, um, you know, he talks about how broken he was after the initial verdict and how it sort of destroyed his faith in the justice system and that sort of stuff. But then Michael later points out that when uh, 
Dave first came to visit him in the prison, Dave said uh, that the, this verdict is maybe harder on me than it is on you. <laughs> and, <laughs> okay. And, my, and Michael was like, uh, you're, you're, you're leaving after this meeting in your BMW <laughs> and it's, yeah. I'm staying here in prison. So yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I maybe taking it a bit for both sides. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I think I think one of the other things that the show's I mean we've been chuckling away at this uh, which is probably completely inappropriate and uh, we'll go to hell but the um one of the other things I think this documentary does very sensitively actually is show the fallout of the crime on the on the wider Peterson family there's five kids in total from various marriages uh, all of them are barely in adulthood uh, dealing you know th- and, and now dealing with the double loss of of parent figures one murdered and one locked up and it's interesting and tragic to see how they negotiate their their loyalties there. Uh, it's uh, I, I feel uh, great sympathy for for Kathleen Peterson's daughter from another marriage who ends up in the prosecution's camp. She doesn't agree to be part of the documentary uh, after a certain point, so you don't get to um, hear from her that much. Um, but it, I mean. I, I, you get the impression that the clinching details are for her just the, the sheer horror of the, the crime scene and the then the revelation that Michael Peterson was having homosexual liaisons, um, which he initially claims that Kathleen knew of, but seems very unlikely. And then he more or less recants that by the end. Um, and I think for a lot of the people who are in the prosecutorial camp, uh, such as Kathleen's sisters, that dishonesty mixed with maybe a bit of bigotry about his sexual practices um, is the thing that really drives a wedge through that family, um, which is uh, otherwise seems to be externally, at least uh, a a happy marriage. Um, Yeah, that was the, that was a frustrating thing about the, um, the affair angle is that the prosecution are so caught up in the homophobia that, um, that that becomes the issue about it and then the defense against it is is you know well this um uh you know the, the fact whether he's bisexual or not shouldn't have any bearing on whether you think he's a murderer or not which is completely true but the fact that he's having an affair is super relevant <laughs> like it's not i don't know for sure uh what their relationship was like and it's totally possible to have a healthy marriage in which there are extramarital uh relations too but it's definitely a possible motive like it's definitely relevant and uh, yeah. at times it seems like there's only two lines there's either bisexuality makes you a murderer or there's no way this could be relevant to the case <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah um do you want to move on to the drama i mean we can come back to the documentary but i i think it's interesting to sort of um move to the drama now because it paints such a different p- picture about the uh the nature of their relationship um between kathleen and michael peterson and i think there's a, a lot of good reason to be really skeptical of the drama like on one hand, I, I really welcome uh, a, 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 an outside perspective on what the original documentary makers were trying to achieve. I, I think it'd be good to explore what biases they had and then developed as the case went on. Um, but like, I just don't trust the drama to have done that because there are so many provable and questionable fictionalizations in the drama. Um, oftentimes, a lot of there are scenes that we have seen in the documentary footage of like, you know, actual conversations, which the drama then reenacts mostly with the same wording, but with a very different spirit, or it combines cuts together conversations, which then change the meaning and the context of those conversations Mm. in a way, which I think is really dishonest. And it's strangely brazen about it because you can just literally go back and compare, uh, with the original way that these things were said. Um, I think one of the main ways it changes, it, it, it amps up the hostility of every scene in a way which is, I, I think they believe will make it more dramatic. So everything becomes like a, this bitter argument with raised voices and clenched fists and like tempers are always simmering. And like, you can go back and you can just see that, you know, it, 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 in some of these conversations, it's Rudolph really genially and gently trying to persuade Michael of something. Hmm. And if anything, Mike, Michael is is not simmering with rage. Like, one of the things that in fact is suspicious about him <laughs> is that he <laughs> yeah. is very glib all the time and quite silly. Like, uh, you know, maybe there was, there was shouting and simmering when the cameras were turned off, but like, 
since the the drama mischaracterizes events when the ca- cameras were turned on, it's hard to make that leap of trust. And what's so weird about it is that actually I think it ends up making the the drama less <laughs> dramatic mm-hmm. uh, because the truth of those scenes was just always more compelling. You know, uh, I, 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 yeah, the drama wants to start, make everything Michael Peterson does feel like every word and and look he he gives like it, it seems like it's hiding potential violence, and you know. The key to this case, I think, is like whatever, whatever happened on that night, it was definitely out of character. You know, Peterson might well have killed his wife. You know, I couldn't possibly say. But that potential violence absolutely does not sing out from his every word and deed. And like to present it as such is not only misleading, but I think it's like philosophically naive. <laughs> it's the, you know, you can read somebody's intentions in their face thing. You you clearly can't. Like, mm. And Peterson's character is typified by this genuinely annoying lightheartedness. He's, he often trivializes things. He's always chuckling. He's always making a, a pithy, ironic comment. And, you know, he would be less suspicious if he took things more gravely. And I also think it just does a disservice to, to Rudolph, you know, who's played like the character of that Michael Stuhl, Stuhlbarg uh, embodies. Is it, it, It's a good performance. It's just not a performance based on David Rudolph, as far as I can tell. And he has a beard, but that's that's about as <laughs> far as the similar, similarity goes. And he plays this, this sort of like nebbishly cerebral, he's unlaughing, he's kind of aggressive. And, and Rudolph is just like diametrically opposite of that. He's charming, mm. like to the extent that some people say that the jury won't like him because they'll find him too slick. And <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know, I just, that just seems wildly wrong <laughs> uh, and uh, unethical. I don't know. Does the drama... Um seem to have a sort of uh, opinion is it sort of pushing you towards uh he's innocent or he's guilty um i mean it's uh, the drama is intending to uh fall exactly on the knife edge of nobody could possibly say uh which is why they they make him as suspicious as possible i think their instincts are to make him feel a lot more suspicious Mm. in his mannerisms in his in the way he behaves uh, but I don't think they needed to do that because it, it is, it is, it's already impossible to say. Um, I, I, it does give us several valuable things that the documentary does not. So first and foremost, it gives us a version of Kathleen Peterson. Um, yeah. It may be like wildly inaccurate uh, as it is with the other characterizations, but I'm very glad that she is at the heart of the drama. We see so much of her life. We hear her worries and her frustrations. And we see her laugh and enjoy herself uh, sometimes too much. And then we sympathize with her when she deals with like work stress and financial peril and bad plumbing. We end up liking her a lot. And, you know, even if all of that is complete fiction, I think it's important because however it happened, it was a truly terrible thing that happened to you know, a deservingly loved person. Uh, and, and and Tony Collette's performance is just like everything it needs to be to make you feel that, I think. Um, and when it plays out each possible means of death that are proposed, which could be really gratuitous and insensitive and perhaps still is. But actually the fact, at least I felt, that you come to deeply dread those scenes, the fact that you actually want to just to make it up those stairs unscathed, means that I think in that measure alone, it was actually successful. But, you know, yeah, I don't know about the rest of it. Hmm. Yeah, that's I've only seen one episode of it, uh, not even a full episode, but um, that struck me right away. I was like, oh, it's really nice to see Kathleen on screen and just have her be a protagonist in this um, rather than it just being the Michael story. Yeah. And also, it does present two additional theories as well as to how these things occurred, both of which never make it to trial. And so do not make up part of the documentary um, at all, except as I think there's one cryptic reference <laughs> um, to a raptor, uh, which I which I take to mean owl. Um, so the, the first one, the owl theory, is interesting because it's... Uh... Oh, no, hang on. No, so the... Hmm. Okay, let's deal with the other one first. So the, the, the one I want to talk about first is uh, it's just such a gobsmacking coincidence that when you hear it, you go, oh, yeah, that, that's obviously what happened. No doubt. Case closed. 
Uh, and then you hun- dis- discover a hundred percent it couldn't have happened. Uh, and, <laughs> and that's, 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 a, I, I mean, maybe it does the Tiger King thing to some extent of, um, presenting an untruth, which is unnecessary or unhelpful, but it, but it ties into the case in such an intimate way. I feel that you kind of have to address it. And so that's sorry, that kind of coincidence is that there is a man who comes forward very early in the days of the trial, um, to claim that he slept with Peterson. Um, and then he is later murdered, uh, by someone who also is a, suspected of sleeping with Peterson. Someone we have reason to believe did not want his relationship becoming public. Um, but that's not just the coincidence. The other coincidence is that the manner of his death exactly matches the wounds that Kathleen Peterson suffered, which are unusual because Kathleen Peterson bleeds to death from multiple lacerations to her scalp um, and does not have any skull or brain damage, which is unheard of in case history, it seems. And yet this man is bludgeoned to death with a torch and also bleeds out without contusions, as you'd expect. Uh, so he is not only the only comparable point in case history in terms of his death and the means of his death, but he is intimately known <laughs> and his murder is intimately known to Peterson. And then, so you're thinking, well, okay, so this guy obviously came in, tried to confront Peterson and, you know, maybe met with Kathleen instead. It never gets that far as presenting that theory because the murderer of that crime was in prison the night that Kathleen died. But he, it's just such a wild and bizarre discovery that I don't know how you can exclude it. Do you agree? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, if nothing else, just for, as a reference point of it's possible for a beating to not have um, uh, skull fractures, um, mm. which is a point in the in the prosecution's favour. Uh, if <laughs> if you um, can't, if the defence is not going for a theory that it, that it was a, a beating. It's kind of similar to the situation with Peterson's friend in Germany, isn't it? Where it's just this massive coincidence that he previously knew a woman, in fact, was close friends with a woman who was found dead, maybe or maybe not, in a puddle of blood at the bottom of a flight of stairs. Where it's, if, if you know, I haven't seen the drama, so I can't, I, I don't know the details, but it, it seems like a thing which is theoretically circumstantial but any person who hears it goes well surely that's surely that's relevant information yeah. well yeah there's a thing i mean there's a there's a great scene uh, in the documentary where rudolph goes what so we meant to think that this go guy goes around stalking women and killing them with staircases <laughs> every every couple of decades but that, i mean that I, I actually do think it is entirely relevant to the case because you could i, I mean you could easily imagine a circumstance in which um, he, he, he got away with something in one way once and then, uh, engineered it a second time. But I, I don't know. I mean, whether that crosses the line into being prejudicial or not, I don't know. The judge eventually believes it probably was overly prejudicial and should have been excluded. Hmm. I mean, I think it's relevant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The second theory is that an owl did it, <laughs> which, yeah. Uh, which sounds stupid. I, I, you were saying that you you were at a gathering the other night, Tom, where this was being related <laughs> as a theory and it caused uh, various acquaintances of you to fall about with absolute laughter. <laughs> yeah. I, so uh, uh, my friend Nels was recounting it uh, to my friend Colin, who has not seen any of the staircase. And uh, within about 10 seconds, Colin was literally on the floor <laughs> writhing around in, in hysterics at, at uh, how implausible it sounds. And it sort of, it definitely sounds more implausible till you know all the other theories and think, oh, <laughs> actually, mm-hmm. they all suck so (laughs) yeah i mean maybe it doesn't satisfy occam's razor but there there are there are a bunch of things in there so like i mean obviously you have the the nature of the wounds which uh which is not superficial wounds i was going to say but didn't cause contusions or, or or skull damage um which you would expect if somebody was you know trying to you mean hit a, sorry, you know, bludgeon just to death. A, just real quick you mean brain contusions right yes sorry yeah, yeah. um 
and there were owls nesting in the trees around the Peterson home. <laughs> and but there had been a number of recorded attacks by this breed of owls uh, in in recent years. I know it's a bit vague on the details of how um, correlated that might be. Um, but the fact that there are owl feathers in her hair seems like quite a big deal. Um, they were they were microscopic owl feathers right yeah but i mean <laughs> i don't know how many owl feathers microscopic or otherwise you're likely to come to come into contact with um just to, maybe they just, just fell off a tree i don't know just I, I mean i don't know but just to paint the picture for the listeners so they're not they're not <laughs> picturing full-sized feathers right yeah i mean the fact that there's blood out found outside the front of the house uh and on the front door is unexplained by any theory that has her killed inside the house um <clears throat> although the crime scene preservation was something of a mess so you could explain it that way but nobody ventures that theory um and several experts uh, have since testified that those wounds could well have been made by an owl's claws though they like the case's original medical examiner continues to disagree um i don't know i don't know <laughs> it doesn't mean it didn't he didn't kill her i just think that the owl theory <laughs> is a better fit than the prosecution's specific theory which is that he killed her with uh, a blowpoke, which is then later found and found not to have any any blood on it. Um, <clears throat> so maybe maybe he trained the owl <laughs> in order to attack women. Yeah. It's, it's also better than the defense's theory, which is that he, she fell down the stairs and you know hit herself that many times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The whole the whole the whole accident theory kind of portrays Kathleen as this <laughs> total klutz, basically, that she she falls down the stairs and hurts her head, but then the theory also requires that she then tries to get up, slips in her own blood, and falls down and hits her head again. Yeah, quite a few times, Hard. I think. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't... Um... It, it doesn't entirely sell me. <laughs> uh, I mean, there's, there's, there's weird things about that where you might say, well, if it was like a, an attack with a weapon, there's, there's no uh, back spatter on, on the ceiling and so forth. But I mean, I, I don't know. Would that necessarily be the case? Yeah, that always seems pretty weak to me. Of like, well, we think if this if it happened in this way, we we would expect to see this kind of thing, and we don't see that thing. Therefore, it couldn't possibly have happened. That always feels like a, there's a few leaps there, like. Okay, your your <laughs> your model expects to see that, but you don't see that. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's it couldn't have happened. I think the the defense was scuppered um, when they made it their argument to say that it was obviously uh, an accident. Like maybe they don't explicitly say that, but the the, the experts they get on they say, "Oh yeah, I'm sure this you know this, yeah this looks like an accident to me." And like anybody looking at that scene, it, they don't engage with the fact that it doesn't look like an accident yeah. at all. And really the, what they should be saying is like, I know this looks like a crime yeah. scene, <laughs> but actually you will be surprised to discover that in X number of other cases, which have been proven as accidents, this similar sort of you know example could be brought forward. But they never do that. They just seem to sort of brush over as they just rely on the experts just to allow it to kind of be wafted away. The idea there is anything other than an accident, and nobody's just nobody's going to buy that. And yeah. They don't. And also, it kind of comes back to what you're saying about like uh, jurors don't don't actually go by the reasonable doubt um, thing mm. because if they did, like really the way this what this trial seems to prove is that. Uh, a an effective defense has to basically persuade you of an alternate theory, not just dis, not just pick holes in the in the prosecution's theory. Uh, basically, the best their strategy is that um, uh, you know you couldn't possibly win by simply pointing out problems with the prosecution's theory. You have to also provide an alternate theory and then try to like you don't technically have to prove it, but you basically have to prove it. You basically have to make it look more likely than than the prosecutions which is not how it's supposed to work at all it's supposed to be if there's any reasonable doubt that what the prosecution is saying is true then you're supposed to acquit them and that puts the defense in a bind because there there isn't a good alternative theory they they deliberate briefly about talk, supposing it might be an intruder but there's no, nothing concrete to point to an intruder and so they think that wouldn't work um and really yeah that it shouldn't work like that yeah i was surprised by that because i think it's david rudolph's bespectacled sidekick who says oh we have to present an alternate theory we can't just poo-poo their theory and i was like well i was surprised by that because i thought 
surely you, you do just have to poo poo there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and in, in the end, in their closing remarks, Dave Rudolph, he does lean on the reasonable doubt thing. You know, he does say, we don't have to prove anything alternate. They have to prove murder and beyond a reasonable doubt. Like they yeah. do return to that at the end, but it feels it's one thing like to that. Say it. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. It's, but it feels like that should have been just the thing they were hammering throughout. Yeah. Are you going to watch the rest of it? Yes, I probably, I don't know if I'll watch the drama or at least not right away, but yeah, I've only got a couple of episodes to go of the, of the documentary. So uh, yeah, I'm definitely going to finish it off. Are you going to watch the drama, Tom? I, I'm in two minds now. <laughs> um, maybe not. Uh, I was, I really want to know these other theories and other details and stuff, but as if, as you say, it, it fudges the truth so much, then I think I'm going to find mm. that frustrating. Yeah, there's, uh, yeah, the, I read an interview with the original documentary makers about the drama, um, and they're very displeased <laughs> uh, for a variety of reasons. I mean, one of the things uh, that appears in the drama, which does not appear in the documentary, is that one of the documentary team uh, eventually goes on to start writing letters to uh, Michael Beeson while he's in prison, and then she goes on to have a relationship with him, um, which is... I mean, that is something that is worth knowing, I think. I mean, you might think that that in some way colors the the shape of the documentary, that uh, um, she's more willing to find him innocent and so cuts the documentary to make him look more innocent would be the charge. But uh, there's no evidence that she was uh, making those sorts of decisions Um there's uh and she also leaves the documentary uh before she starts on her uh, embarks on a relationship with peterson so there is no overlap she's not still shaping the documentary whilst uh in a relationship with him as the drama posits which seems like a pretty huge thing to posit um wait the drama drama implies that there was an overlap yeah yeah absolutely uh, and not only an overlap, but that she is intentionally editing things to <laughs> to make him look more innocent, um, <laughs> sure. which I don't think Christ. you could come away with. I, I mean, I, I think if you watch the documentary, I mean, it's definitely not clear. That, I mean, it's definitely not saying he's in, innocent, right? I mean, uh, I came away from the documentary thinking that it could go either way still. So I, I don't think it leans on the scales particularly. I don't know. I, I I did feel that the documentary was making the case for his innocence. Like we don't get much from the prosecution. We don't get much from the uh, you know partly because they they wouldn't participate, but we don't get much from the um, uh, the relatives who are who are against him. It's very much like the daughters who believe in him, him, his lawyer. It's mm. all all the main characters are the the defense. Yes, there's a bias on, on the access that they get. I think. Um... I, th- I think they would have carried on shooting footage, though, if it had <laughs> indicted him. I don't get a sense that they they uh, were keen to shape what was happening in front of the camera in any way. But I mean, I guess you can't really tell. That's why I use the word filter rather than bias for this. Is like sometimes it's not necessarily opinions for the people making it, but there's a filter on on what they get, yeah. and so there's a filter on what's been presented. I did. That does touch on something like uh, the staircase is much gorier than the other documentaries we're going to talk about. I think like um, they really don't shy away from showing crime scene photos and that sort of stuff. And so like, uh, although yeah, their access is very much focused on the defense and the family. It's, it's almost counterbalancing just how horrific the scene is and yeah it, it does feel like everyone who sees those photos would draw the same conclusion as the cops do which is well obviously this is a murder and so it, it still felt relatively balanced to me or or at the very least not too strongly arguing that that he was innocent so much as you know showing you something that really suggests he's guilty and then spending more time presenting the opposite Speaking of these other documentaries, shall we talk about Sophie, a murder in West Cork? Yeah, I don't. I, I watched this. I remember recommending it, but I don't actually remember much about it, apart from the fact that it it has a really terrible poem about dolphins in it, <laughs> <laughs> which is not necessarily what you'd uh, expect. But I, I do remember it throwing up quite a lot of uh, uh, unexpected things. It was 
definitely uh, entertaining in a way which felt very guilty. <laughs> um, so it's a it's a case about a French woman in West Cork who was found murdered outside her holiday home. Uh, her name is Sophie Tuscan Duplantier, uh, and she'd been visiting that area for years, oftentimes for for weeks or months at a time. And uh, suspicion, well, at the at the time it's investigated, I think around 1996, and. There is an anonymous phone call sometime during the investigation from someone who says they saw a man called Ian Bailey walking home at 3 a.m. in the morning um, somewhere near where the crime took place. And so suspicion at that point falls on Ian Bailey. But they don't bring charges because there's not enough evidence to do so. But... The, the documentary is kind of coming in many years later where uh, there just keep being new developments in the case. So they eventually find the person who made that anonymous phone call. Um, it's a woman named Marie Farrell. And she says that the reason she didn't want to be identified was that the reason she was there in the middle of the night was that she was with a man who wasn't her husband. She didn't want that to be known. Um, but then, you know, over the course of the documentary, like, she recants that story and, and changes her testimony and says that actually she didn't see him at all. Um, and so like layer by layer, like the, the case becomes sort of muddled. Uh, at the same time, Ian Bailey, who is like initially like uh, suspected of having done this murder, he launches after they don't press charges because they decide there's not enough evidence, he launches a libel trial against, I think, five newspapers who all reported on the case uh, since his name has apparently been cleared. But then he loses the libel trial. Um, but in the process, a bunch of documents and new evidence and new details of the investigation become public because they get put into the public record as part of that trial. And so, like, it absolutely works against him. Um, meanwhile, like secondary to this or, or it's not really secondary to it but um uh, france is trying to extradite him because sophie is a french citizen and under french law they want a trial they want to try any person accused of murdering a french citizen no matter where that murder happens in the world and so there is this like ongoing attempt to extradite him to france which ireland uh resists and he doesn't go and so france trial him in absentia and actually find him guilty and so the 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 documentary kind of charts this the story where over the course of it you just find more and more evidence that he did it he loses the libel trial because it sure as heck seems like he did it he gets found guilty in france but he's never imprisoned because he just doesn't go to france <laughs> Uh, and so he's he's just still living in this town, essentially. Um, and the, the murder is supposedly unresolved. Is that I mean, he's, like... He's just, kind of tr yeah, that was. I'm very glad that you had the details so much better <laughs> yeah. in, in mind than I did, because a lot of that was like, oh, yeah, you're right. Oh, shit, I forgot about that. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was very much the, the unique thing about this one. I mean, first of all, it sort of starts out like it's going to be this, this open-ended mystery of like, who could have possibly have done it? And then by episode, like, two or three you're like oh it's that guy he just fucking did it like, <laughs> uh, that that's that was um the he just fucking did it that i foreshadowed in the intro of like <laughs> i know at some point during this podcast i'm gonna end up saying that but please don't take it that way um uh and then yeah it's, it's just so fucking surreal that he's he's found guilty in france and you know yeah like i say i think that's probably the right verdict um uh, and yet he's just still just not only is he still in Ireland and still free, but he's just like the local town eccentric. He's just like down there and they show him in the town square. I think he's selling something for a briefcase or something. And he's dressed in these bizarre clothes and to just like the weirdo downtown who, you know, murdered that girl that one time. It's just so surreal. It's a, it's a some strange hippie-ish community made up of eccentrics. And it, uh, I think I think it does try to do a good job of sort of articulating the family's grief and talking about the victim's life, but I, all that stuff can't help but get overshadowed by the fact it is really fun <laughs> uh, in a, a terrible way. Like there's so many left field twists that it, it can't help but feel entertaining, and all of the people who are in it are just these incredible eccentrics. Um, I, yeah, I don't know how I felt about it. I felt like it was. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, 
when there is an example of truly terrible dolphin poetry, <laughs> you can't help but laugh, and it feels like that is the wrong mood <laughs> uh, for something well, they, in this uh, vein. They, they bring on all these, you know, they they talk to a lot of the the colourful characters in the community. Um, one of whom I think is a, a quite well-respected novelist, and it feels like she's there as a talking head purely so she can totally eviscerate his poetry <laughs> at one point, <laughs> which is completely like unrelated to the case or the allegations against them uh, uh, entirely. But it's, yeah, it is, it is funny. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, again, would, would you venture to say whether he did it or not? Is that, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't say because that could be libel, but I mean, <laughs> well, do you have an opinion <laughs> that you feel you can form from this? Yeah, I mean, well, I think if we're worried about libel, then we're going to have to edit maybe some things that Tom just said. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows where I stand? <laughs> yeah, like a, a lot of the evidence seems to point towards him having done it. There are things in this documentary which are funny, um, and there are th- lots of things in this documentary which absolutely aren't funny and which aren't depicted in any way as entertaining, including... Talking about, um, because Ian Bailey, the man who's accused, he's uh, lived in the town with, I don't, I'm not sure if it's his wife or his girlfriend, um, but it basically comes out over the course of the investigation that uh, he's physically abusive towards her and has been several times in the past. And I think they do like a good job of, of dealing with that. Um, mm. His, his f- now former partner doesn't take part in the documentary, um, but they talk to a number of people that, that knew her and knew them and like police officers and that sort of stuff to, to include that perspective in there and, and, and to cover the seriousness of it. Um, well, I mean, the things, I mean, the, the fact that he has a past history of beating his partner to a pulp is, is pretty damning, but also he has excessively early knowledge of the murder. Like it hasn't even been reported anywhere yet. And he seems to be going around telling people about it. That's the whole thing I didn't even mention when I was summarizing the case is that um, he's a journalist and he's reporting on the case for newspapers in the UK and yeah, he's he's he seems to be the journalist in the know as to the details of the case, and so he's getting work off the back of it before they realize that maybe the reason he knows is because he was the person who did it. I failed to mention that up front, but that's a fairly substantial revelation. Should we talk about the unsolved murder of Beverly Lynn Smith? Yeah. Do you do you want to summarize this one? Or yeah. Should I? <laughs> well, I'll do my best and you can jump in if I if I miss anything or if I um uh, get anything wrong. Um so this this is the most twisty turny one I've seen I think in terms of episode to episode like your understanding of it twists on its head. Um uh, but as as we warned up front we are going to spoil the whole thing. Um so uh it's revolves around it's almost hard to know where to start because they it doesn't go in chronological order this one. Um Alan Smith is um basically a lonely old man who was once accused of murder and um uh don't want to say acquitted but maybe not tried um and um uh, of the murder of of beverly lynn smith which we'll get to but um the uh the true crime show starts with him um getting involved he meets he meets a friend on a fishing trip he wins a competition which is um suspicious um and goes on a fishing trip and meets this guy and they become great friends and then this guy gets in, him involved in like dealing drugs and um and stealing drugs uh, at gunpoint um uh and then they're getting involved with this this gang boss who um uh wants them to dispose of a body for him which which uh they do and uh then says to them um Look, you've just you've got something on me now because you know I killed this guy, and uh, I need to have something on you. So you've got to tell me something terrible from your past so that we're equal. Otherwise, I can't trust you, and I got to worry about you. And so, under that duress, Alan Smith, um, uh, well, says initially that he doesn't have anything and, and can't do it, and uh, then is pressed and pressed and pressed, and it just really comes to the point of like we're going to kill you unless you t- unless you confess to something, and. Um, says that, uh, oh, you know that murder ages ago that was in the papers? Um, I was in on that. I was part of the group that did it. Um, uh, and then 
uh, the guy says, that's not enough. It's not good enough. Cause you know, you know, I killed somebody. I got to know something of, of equal value. And so then he says, oh, actually it wasn't just a group. It was me. I did it. And, um, uh, gives some details that turn out to not match the case. Uh, and it turns out that both of those people, the friend and the gang boss, are both undercover cops. And this was entirely a sting operation to get him to confess to this murder, uh, which they then say, OK, we've got him. He confessed, like <laughs> bang to rights. So it's just the most extraordinarily tortured, sloppy, immoral, useless <laughs> framing operation that the police could possibly have done. Where just like that, you know, confession under duress, it's as if they've never heard of that phrase and don't imagine that any amount of duress can ever invalidate a confession. Um, so like they literally put him in a situation where he thinks he has to confess to mur- literally to murder specifically or he will die <laughs> and then say, we got him. <laughs> um, and the murder itself is, is it was, uh, uh, Beverly Lynn Smith lived, uh, they're not related, by the way, um, lived across the r- road from him. They knew each other. Um, and uh, the prosecution's theory is that he was buying drugs from her partner um, and that his partner wasn't there at the time. Um, but the, they think that went wrong and he shot her in, as part of that, um, which just never really, as far as we can tell from this documentary, there, there doesn't seem to be a lot of evidence um, supporting that. Uh, but they kind of fixate on him. And really, the, the sort of the particulars of, of that case, it is unsolved. Um, uh, you know, uh, we don't know who did it, but the all of the kind of interest of this case is is the extraordinary frame up job that the the Canadian cops did. Um, uh, by the way, weird little trivia thing takes place in Durham, Ontario, uh, which is the same name as the county that the staircase takes place in, <laughs> but that's Carolina. I got really confused for a while because I was just looking at the details of this. Like, wait, Durham, isn't that, it can't be the same place. <laughs> um, but then the, the other weird little subplot of this, which is sort of tragic and, and agonizing to watch is um, uh, uh, Alan's partner. Do you remember her name, Graham? Uh, no, I don't. Sorry. Um Alan's, uh, I think, wife at the time, now ex-wife, um, uh, initially is his alibi, so he, he couldn't have done it because uh, he was with her, and then um, later changes her mind and and uh, says that he uh, that he that he did leave for a while, um, but basically that the cops are kind of keep interviewing her and keep trying to pressure her and kind of a little bit like Brendan Dassey and making a murderer. Um, I don't know if this if this woman had has any learning difficulties, but it becomes very clear from the footage uh, where she's being interviewed that she just w- sort of wants to tell people what they want to hear, and that she will basically say anything if if sufficiently pressured. Um, and that's bad enough when it's the cops doing it, but she also kind of finds a friend, Janet, who is um, also. Uh, do you remember what the religious angle is, Graham? Is she a are they part of think, a church? I think they're just, yeah, I think they're part of the same church, I think. Um, basically, it becomes a friend of Alan Smith's ex-wife. Um, and uh, uh, also her kind of spiritual guide. You know, she kind of finds religion through this woman and looks up to her as a spiritual leader. And that woman hears about the case and takes it upon herself to try and break through the wall uh, that that she has put up around uh, around the real truth of that night and basically keeps pressuring her you know even outside of what the police are doing to her um to try and get her to say uh what they uh want her to say and yeah just just messes up the whole thing in an even more chaotic way um that you know at one point this woman confesses doing the murder herself (laughs) and then retracts that as well and it's it's awful you just see her getting such a such a muddle and and you know so stressed about it and trying to make everybody happy but everyone's trying to get her to do um uh you know all all conflicting different accounts of it linda linda is her name linda thank you um yeah and it's it's worth so the the murder that took place uh happened in beverly lynn smith's kitchen she was shot in the back of the head no gun was found at the scene nothing was stolen there was no apparent motive at the time and alan smith who lived across the road was briefly considered as a suspect but then dismissed because there was no evidence that he was in the house and he had no apparent motive or any of this and his wife gave him an alibi and so they didn't even arrest him or anything like that at that point and 
everything else that happens is 30 years after that. <laughs> it's, it's 30 years after the crime has taken place that they're coming back to it. And uh, Alan Smith is arrested. The charges are dropped due to a lack of evidence. And then in 2014, he's arrested again after what's the, what's called a big shot. Uh, no, sorry, Mr. Big. Mr. Big. Yeah, Mr. Big sting operation. And it's, I mean, it's remarkable for the cast of characters. And, and this is what I was saying earl- earlier about them all being sad, lonely people, essentially. Like, Alan Smith is this old loner with no friends. And so when he makes a friend on this fishing trip, this guy becomes like his entire world, basically, because he's his best friend and he'll do anything for him. And Linda is sort of a similar situation where her only social outlet and her like only status within the community is her membership in this church community. And this is, so did you say her name was Judy or Jenny? Janet. What was the Janet. Yeah, and, and Janet has power in that social setting. So Linda is afraid, or seeming seems to be afraid, that if she doesn't, you know, open up to what she knows and tell the truth, then she's going to be thrown out of this community. And basically all of these people have just become so, so willing to do anything the police tells them to. And Janet's motivation seems to just be, you know she's getting a source of like uh, social status from the fact that she's working with the police. You know, these people are wearing wires while having conversations with supposed friends, like, you know, asking them questions again and again and again. And yeah, and it's, it's very much like the making a murderer case. Cause we see the tape of the police officer asking Linda questions again and again and again for, you know, eight hours, 10 hours, a dozen hours, and then coming back a week later, two weeks later, and asking her the same questions for the same amount of time. And at points telling her what he wants to hear. And she's, you know, she starts talking about how dreams she's had that seem to Mm. reveal more information about the case. And it's, it's, I mean, eyewitness testimony there is a, a growing understanding, I think, that uh, eyewitness testimony is often untrustworthy, especially when it's been decades since the events actually took place, and it's very easily warped. And the, the police have no qualms about warping that testimony to their own goals in this this documentary. Do you think he did it, Tom? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, truly, no, I don't. I, I mean, my, I lean no on this one because um, uh, it just doesn't. There just doesn't seem to be anything there. There's no, not strong enough connection, not strong enough motive, not strong enough. It's just a guy who lived across the street. There's no, um, there's no reason to narrow the, the the suspect list to him. You know. Yeah, yeah, I lean towards innocence in this case as well, and at the very least, like there just seems to be no evidence um, that he did do it, other than. The, the confession gained from him after ex- yeah, extreme duress. Just and so... it's like, you know, <laughs> even, even in that situation where he thinks he's going to get shot, if he doesn't hand over, uh, like something incriminating about himself, he still spends hours, <laughs> you know, not saying anything. And yeah. they also, because they've been recording him for such a long period of time, like in situations where he's just talking to a friend where uh, he doesn't know he's being recorded. So he has no reason to bring up or like deny anything in that context. He constantly brings up the case from his distant past because he's still so like angry and outraged about the fact that he was accused of this. Mm. And like, you wouldn't, <laughs> if if he had done it, say, uh, and had gotten away with it, I don't think he would just in social <laughs> situations constantly be bringing up pure yeah. like anger and obsession about being <laughs> accused of this thing. You would you would think they would just not want to talk about it at all. Um, I forgot to explain when I uh, did the rundown of the the police uh, snare operation that um, I, I mentioned them that they actually did dispose of a body. I should clarify that wasn't really a body. <laughs> he, he thought, <laughs> yeah. Alan thought it was like, he never saw it fully, but there was a, a mannequin in a, in a duffel bag. And so they like, it was the whole thing was this bizarre elaborate 
sort of B movie production that they put on. I mean, there's no way. I mean, okay, this is this is overstepping the, the bounds of what I could possibly know, but it does feel a bit like the police are just having fun past a certain point. Like they get into <laughs> it and they're just like, "We're having doing this cool movie." Uh, it's it's also worth noting that like, you know he was arrested after this Mr. Big operation, and then it was all that evidence was completely thrown out instantly yeah. and he yeah, was never God. actually brought to trial off the back of it and uh you know like the practice of mr big stings which are complete, uh, they're illegal in the united states uh they're only legal in canada it's you know it's been reviewed and yeah which is a good thing <laughs> <laughs> yep definitely doesn't seem like a reliable way to get to the truth <laughs> do you want to talk about the police doing a good job for a change yeah it's, yeah <laughs> When, when did this happen? <laughs> well, this is the uh, the film uh, The Investigation, um, which is uh, a dramatization um, and uh, an unusually good one of the investigation into the murder of the journalist Kim Wall, um, which was, I was in Sweden when this was going on. It was huge news there. Uh, it made uh, headlines every day. It made even more headline catching by the involvement of a homemade submarine which um, Kim Wall was invited to inspect by the inventor of said submarine. She disappears and then later parts of her start to wash ashore Um, and obviously the suspicion falls on him quite rightly because he definitely did do it. Um, (laughs) I thought uh, when I heard about this as a dramatization that it was um, kind of too soon really, because it was such uh, such grim reading in, in Sweden at the time. But this is a very unusually, um, I think, incredibly respectful. Uh, it's at great pains to ensure that the crime is completely unglamorized. Uh, and it's unique, as far as I can tell, in that the perpetrator's name is never used. And there is no actor playing the perpetrator. The character is never, ever shown on screen during the entire series. Um, And somehow, uh, such is the sophistication with which this is composed, that that never feels weird. Um, Yeah. And the ins and the outs of the investigation itself are interesting, um, especially because uh, there's an incredibly high bar for proving guilt in Denmark. Uh, unlike really any of the other uh, instances <laughs> yeah. that we've talked about here today. And like, the, the, weirdly, the program comes off as critical of that. But like, I, I would urge <laughs> the people involved to watch all of these other crime documentaries because if it was not for that high bar, then they would be making films about wrongful convictions instead. Um, I, I, it clearly, you know, deeply frustrates the uh, investigation uh, here that they that they can't prove guilt, and uh, it seems that the um, the accused can basically continuously change their story, and the contradiction yeah. between those stories is not considered to be uh, an, an indicator of guilt in itself. You, they that's, always. That's something to... I wanted to. Uh... Sorry to uh, uh, check about actually because th- this is the wildest part to me is one of the most frustrating things as they once they clearly have the guy banged to rights and they're, they're trying to make the case uh, each time they find something that disproves his story he changes his story uh, and they keep saying like that that's his right he's allowed to do that but I what I couldn't understand is are they not allowed to bring that up at trial can they not sort of point to that as evidence of his of least suspicion of, of guilt at trial it seems not yeah because um... they also the other thing like because they're talking about they're talking as if they can't bring that up at trial. Then I'm thinking, why do they have to keep telling him the new information? Can't they wait till trial, then spring it on him to to disprove whatever theory, whatever account he's giving at that point? Yeah, I I don't know the 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 complete ins and outs there, but it's um I think I'm right in saying that Denmark doesn't have juries uh, of the people as we understand them. They are professional jurors um, huh. who uh, hmm. who determine. Um, uh, the guilt of a, of a person or not um so maybe they they are considered to have a level of discretion that is above the standard set by the general public and so they're able to pick these things apart more in i don't know um but it, it's it's really uh it's a really a moving and uh powerful film it, it talks a lot about kim wall as a person and uh, her parents are in it a great deal a character you know characterizations of her parents um 
And I think it's also interesting because this is a thing that I, I felt a great deal when I was living in, in Sweden is that there's a level of sort of Nordic self-criticism and doom mongering uh, there, which is that they uh, kind of reasonably fixate upon the very few crimes that they have. Um, like a character <laughs> in this points out that there were only 50 murders in the entirety of Denmark during the year in which it's set. But it feels to people like things are terrible like things are so much worse precisely because there are so few because because there are so few the public hears about every single detail of every single one <laughs> mm. and um as a result the, 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 the sort of more gloomier uh outlook on 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 the state of justice which is probably not deserved it's a very safe place <laughs> yeah yeah, I thought this was really good, and it was really interesting to see that uh, philosophy um, of of true crime, in which you just sort of refuse to glorify the perpetrator. I mean, obviously, in this case, you know, um, they know the perpetrator, and they, they he was convicted, so the, the guilt is not in question. It'd be harder to do this in a case where the guilt is not established, or it, or the the question mark over the guilt is the point of the documentary. Um, but yeah, it was. Um, really well done and fascinating and also just interesting to see how a different justice system works and and how different it is mm. where can one watch the investigation i, I watched it on iplayer i think uh, i don't know where it is now i'm afraid for me it was here in canada it was on crave okay. <laughs> good luck <laughs> <laughs> move to one of those countries and <laughs> Um, I did want to mention something I just watched super recently, uh, even though it's not by any stretch the best of these um, documentaries. Uh, it's on HBO Max over here. Don't know where it's going to turn up anywhere else. Um, it's called The Murders at Starved Rock, um, and it's uh, unusual amongst its uh, true crime peers for being a really super old case. It's about... Um, a 1960 triple homicide uh, of uh, three women who were placed on a uh, sort of macabre display in a canyon in Starved Rock in Illinois. Um, and it's a crime for which a guy called Chester Weger has been imprisoned for 59 years. Um, and it does, a, it does a, a particularly poor job, I would say, of framing the victims uh, in terms of uh, them having much interest or sympathy um, as people. Um Partly, I guess that's because most of the people who knew them are now dead. Um, but it, what it does do is it shows how that community um, is completely riven over this event. Um, uh, and the extent to which, because it takes place over, again, many decades, the extent to which the interest in that event sort of metastasizes into conspiracy theory and factualism and so forth within that community um, and also how the standards of justice change across the decades the responsibilities of prosecutors you know the, the big question is would that conviction have happened today with the same evidence um, and it's it's hard to say because clearly justice doesn't get done today <laughs> to our satisfaction anyway but it's clearly true that the quality of the investigation was also deeply dubious and the, the other strange and remarkable thing about this film is that the documentary maker himself is the son of the prosecutor who puts Chester Weger away uh, and so there's this father-son dynamic uh, which again plays out across the decades because the documentary cannibalizes like an earlier documentary that the filmmaker made in the 2000s when his father was still alive and he interviews his father and many others about the case who since died. Um, and then there's new material which frames that with more recent developments um, uh, after the death of lots of those interviewees. Um, and that, that father-son relationship is interesting by itself. Like it's not quite explicitly explored there's obviously a tension there which is not fully described by the films but the filmmaker just essentially you know his, his father's like uh you know an uh, an attorney uh and he, he rejects the sort of family law business and goes off to be a hairdresser in europe for, for several decades he also yeah. has a fabulous beard um and there's obviously like a, a lifestyle tension between him this sort of like hippie-ish kid and his dad who is quite fire and brimstone and turns up at all the uh, parole hearings to say the only thing i'm sorry about in this case is i didn't get to give him the chair and all this kind of other stuff um 
very inconclusive <laughs> again about whether he did it or not. Um, there are later discoveries. The filmmaker himself makes like a, a, a discovery which is presented as being last minute. But again, it goes back to that Tiger King thing of making the film dramatic at the expense of the truth, which I, I feel rather awkward about. The filmmaker claims to have uh, uncovered a letter supposedly by Chester Weger to Chester Weger's father, in which he doesn't exactly admit culpability for the crime, but he says, uh, he, he it's very cryptic, but he seems to be saying, that he was part of it in some way and wasn't fully responsible for it. Um, but the provenance of that letter is never really described at all. And there's so much other horseshit floating around about the case. It's really hard to, to, for it to really have an impact. But it's, it's clear that the filmmaker himself, having previously made uh, his 2000s documentary, more or less trying to vindicate Chester Weger, he now clearly thinks he did have a part in it. Um, but we'll never know because uh, everybody apart from Uyghur is dead. And and the terrible irony of it is that he Chester Uyghur was freed eventually. He won his parole hearing and then got out and COVID lockdown happened. Uh, so he was essentially re-imprisoned, um, which is kind of brutal because he's a very old man. Um, but oh, oh, yeah, also there was a development just last week, actually. Um, is he, uh, he he sent off there were hairs found in the grip of one of the victims and they were able to send it off a DNA analysis and the results came back literally last week. Um, no Chester Weger DNA in those hairs, but that doesn't necessarily rule him out as a participant. It just means there was somebody else there, which I think was already pretty obvious uh, from just the, the crime itself. But yeah, interesting, but perhaps not a good film, I would say. <laughs> would you recommend watching it on those grounds i mean it's, it's only three episodes so i think you know <laughs> i mean it, it is interesting again it has the small town thing of uh, everybody in it being just wild caricatures of what humans normally look like um <laughs> yeah i don't i i have some questions about the, the credibility of it as a documentary though i don't know whether it I, it, it it does its best, but I, I think there are ways in which it sets out the, 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 the terms of the investigation which put too much of the filmmaker in it in a way which does expose the filter that he's going through, as as you say, Tom, but but also by the same stroke makes you question <laughs> quite a lot. Um, I don't know. Yeah. It's interesting, looking at all these kind of together... The staircase really does stand out, both as the one that we we all sort of uh, focused on the most, had the most to to, to say about, um, but also uh, as you said, it's like a very grisly one, and it's grisly because the the guilt or innocence or the 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 uh, figuring out what what happened depends on the forensics so much. Like it, that is the, the absolute mm. heart of the issue. Is is does the um, uh, does the evidence uh, is the evidence consistent with this theory or that theory? And the evidence is very much like the injuries, uh, so it's, you kind of can't get away from it um, and and still investigate the thing, um, which is gruesome. And it, it's right at the um, uh, the crux of a lot of different discomforts <laughs> that I have with true crime. You know, I felt uneasy watching the staircase sometimes, partly because I do feel like. Michael Peterson is the protagonist of it. And if he did it, it is pretty gross that he gets his own TV show, two different TV shows um, <laughs> centering on him. Obviously they're, they're, you know, not, they don't paint him in a glowing light, but um, uh, that has made me feel uneasy at times. Then of course, you know, I am fascinated by it. I'm really curious as to what happened, you know, either way, no matter what the theory is in every scenario, because all the theories are slightly difficult to believe, everything must have some twist to it some some detail and i'm a very like detail oriented person and i want to know i mentioned the mechanics of things and in this case that brings you straight into the grisliest nastiest part and this is a real person who really did die and it was a, a, a horrific tragedy and there's i think you know there are people who have to for their jobs detach from that you know, doctors have to do that um, medical examiners have to do that um, and it's good that they can and it's good that they do and but i uh, I sit there wondering, am I allowed to do that? <laughs> like, I think I can. I think if I try, I can. I, I can separate the person and look at the science of it. But it's not my job. I'm just doing this really for like I wouldn't call it fun, but sort of morbid fascination, I guess. And I'm really yeah conflicted about that line. Part of me wants to dig real deep into it. I, I have read the 
the coroner's report um, uh, on Kathleen Peterson's death uh, because I just because I didn't understand from the documentary. Like, are you saying this? Like, when you say lacerations, do you mean does that mean something cut it or can that be a split and all this kind of gross stuff? And I just wanted to like get as close to the source as possible just to try and understand the mechanics of it. And I I, I sense a rabbit hole there that I perhaps shouldn't go down. <laughs> I think I need to like get a sense of perspective and think. Okay, I don't have to be ghoulish for my job, so maybe I won't. <laughs> I won't choose to be ghoulish as a pastime. Do you think there's any crimes for which somebody can never be forgiven? Never allowed back into society? <laughs> I mean, I'm pretty wow, sure that neither question. of you are. <laughs> well, I, I think it's interesting to see uh, try, true crime documentaries because it does make you question how uh, how much forgiveness you would be able to um, uh, give in those circumstances. I, I'm pretty sure neither of you are advocates for the death penalty, but I don't actually know where really you stand on like the Anders Brevix of this world, for example. You know, are they beyond any kind of rehabilitation? Yeah, I think there's maybe two different threads to that. One is sort of punishment, retribution, sort of forgiveness and absolution. Um, and on that spectrum, I don't believe in a system of justice that's based around punishment as in retribution. Like I don't, uh, you know, in the abstract sense, if I was structuring society, we're far removed from it. Um, I would not feel the need to work in retribution for, for crimes. I would be entirely focused on prevention and rehabilitation where possible. Um, and then the separate question is, okay, can anyone, are there such crimes where the person can never be rehabilitated? Um, and, uh, I think that's much harder to answer um, and probably is, I, I think that there's probably a huge gap between, you know, if it, for any given person, could that person be re rehabilitated? You know, uh, I guess I'd say there's probably isn't any crime for which every single person who's ever committed that crime is fundamentally incapable of rehabilitation, but there may well be people who it's beyond the capacity for, for society to ever rehabilitate them to, you know, um, who knows what we mean by rehabilitation, but at mm. the very least get to the point where that they are not at risk of committing that again. I agree with Tom as regards rehabilitation. Um, I am okay with people being permanently removed from society uh, in certain circumstances. Like it feels like a thing that, you know, it helps maintain the social order, I suppose. You know, I, I, it goes beyond... Obviously, victims' families don't have legal rights in these situations. It's not them bringing a, a court case against someone that's alleged to have murdered their victim. It's the state that's doing it. But I think for me, that goes beyond ideas of retribution or vengeance. And you're getting into um, people's faith, for lack of a better word, in the a just world, essentially. Um and I, I think there's there's value to that 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 extends beyond vengeance, and I think that's partly maintained by there being severe consequences to for people who commit severe acts of destruction. Yeah, I should have uh, maybe when I mentioned prevention, I'm talking about both deterrence and preventing. Uh, what's the word? A re recommitting of crimes. <laughs> so <laughs> you know, it make it Reci does make sense to have. Recidivism, yes, thanks. Um, it does make sense to have severe punishments for crimes separately from retribution because it deters people from committing those crimes, if it does. Um, you know, and I, I, don't, I can't speak to whether it does, but, uh, you know, I think it does on some level, <laughs> to some extent, but is it, <laughs> is it, how effective is it? Um, and how bad, how, like, to what extent do you make the punishment worse to increase the deterrence? I think there's probably a threshold past which the people who are still committing crimes are not uh, going to are not going to be less likely to do so if the punishment gets more unpleasant. If prisons get worse conditions, you know, if if prison becomes yeah. uh, a really inhumane place to live, uh, that probably won't actually affect the rates of crime in a positive way <laughs> because uh, a, a lot of the people going to jail. I mean, some of them are innocent, and some of them um, are just behaving in a uh, in a manner that doesn't factor in long-term consequences like that's uh that can be a reason that someone commits a crime with that they have no hope of getting away with even though they know the punishment's gonna be terrible and even though they will they will hate the punishment um they may still do it because they just don't have a sort of long-term consequence thing that's just a sort of a stray example as obviously a huge spectrum and and massively complex landscape of different um uh you know causes of crime and stuff 
but yeah, that's, that's kind of my thinking. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that in terms of it's value as a deterrent. Well, having solved justice on this video games podcast, <laughs> um, onto the more important question of, uh, when the cops dig up your patios and justice finally catches up with you both, will you be happy to have a true crime documentary made about your conviction? <laughs> uh, tough hypothetical. My patio is, is actually on my roof, so if they dig down, they'll just get into my lounge and I'll just be here. <laughs> how about you? Oh, like, mine, how would you oh, feel? My, 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 I've got a title, which is the most important thing, which would be Marsh colon In Cold Mud. <laughs> i mean for that reason alone of course yes <laughs> i would accept a true crime documentary is that all the time we have for crime i think that is all the time we have for crime if you'd like to uh tweet us you can do so at crate and crowbar uh you can see uh, all of these recordings as videos which are just a static thumbnail so you wouldn't really need to see them but you can do that uh, and find other nonsense by us at youtube.com slash crate and crowbar. Thanks as always to our backers on Patreon. You can back us too at patreon.com slash crate and crowbar, or you can simply join our lovely Discord community, the link for which is on our website, crate and crowbar.com. That's it. I've been Marsh Davis. I've been Graham Smith. And I've been Tom Francis. <laughs>